I think that there's never been a, a more exciting time to be an artist than today. You have more control, more options. The barriers to entry are lower. Without a lot of red tape, you can go create music. You can go promote your music. You can find your fan base. You can get your music out to the maximum listeners. And technology is evolving. Don't be afraid to experiment. Don't be afraid to embrace new technologies and test, because I think that we're about to enter a very, very exciting phase where technology is going to continue to take music to new places. And I'm really excited to see where it goes. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's your reviews. You are listening to Notables, an Education Through Music podcast. As always, I'm your host, Noah, and in this episode, I'm joined by Andrea Gleason, the CEO of TuneCore. Andrea, thanks so much for joining me for the show. Thank you so much for having me on. It's uh, it's really a pleasure. Could you tell me a little bit about your early experiences with music instruction? I played piano. Uh, started when I was in the fourth grade, and uh, you know, just my mom really wanted me to to have that foundation of learning how to read music, how to play it, how to appreciate it, and uh, did a lot of classical music playing uh, for three years, uh, and then my mom got sick of trying to make me practice as I started to get older, <laughs> so we dropped it after a while. Um, but uh, I also sang a lot in church, uh, was a part of choir, so uh, that was always a lot of fun. I feel like I learned a, a lot about how to harmonize between the piano and understanding chord structure and uh, and then being a part of choir and really learning how to sing as a unit. I feel like you learn a lot, not just uh, about music theory, but also like how to do something as a team when you're a part of, of programs like choir. Right. Um, and likewise with band, I dabbled a little bit in learning um, flute and uh, did a little clarinet. Didn't, none of them really stuck. I think probably piano was the thing I spent the most time on. Uh, but, you know, I think, I think they teach you discipline, practice, uh, teaches you to... Um, you know, just appreciate music and art artistry. Um, I remember spending time at the piano and just trying to like try out to play something and make up a song uh, and compose something just for fun uh, and just see where your creativity takes you. Never saw myself having a career with that, but just like, you know, if you draw, it's like a form of that. And I think it, it helps you appreciate art and the things around you. And you can bring that creativity into other parts of your work. This point that she made about being part of a unit really resonates with me. I, I hadn't thought about that, but the it, when you're playing a piano, you've got the whole instrument in front of you. That's but right. when you're singing in a in a choir or you're playing flute in a band, you're just one piece of a large instrument. That's correct. Uh, and so that that like idea of functioning as a team, it's because you're you're like one key in an instrument. <laughs> exactly. And sometimes you know different parts of that team will have moments where they are sort of in the forefront and then mm -hmm. they're you're supporting that person that's in the forefront uh, and i think that uh you know it's just a, a lot of good things you learn about life and just how things play out in the real world yeah like stepping in stepping back exactly. making room for other voices and exactly so you never saw yourself becoming a musician no uh where where did you see yourself going and do, what did you see yourself doing you know, I um, I grew up pretty religious, and so I don't think I had a very clear view of my career early on because, well, let me back up a little bit, too. Um, so I was born in Romania. Mm -hmm. I came to the U.S. when I was four, and uh, my parents were immigrants, so they literally had to start their lives over and didn't understand how the U.S. education system worked, didn't know how to really advise me. And then because I grew up very religious and went to a very religious high school, like you just are kind of a part of a different ecosystem and you don't really think about all the options and possibilities. So right. when I entered college, I just, you know, did one year of just basics and then really started to 
think about, okay, well, I would like to try this. So I started off being a psychology major. And then I uh, did an internship and realized that I don't really like hearing people's problems all day. <laughs> but I like learning how the mind works mm -hmm. and why we do certain things. And I find sociology fascinating. I find that in your life, you can take things that you experience, even if it's not where you go long term, just like how piano is not something that I pursued long term. That right. you know, little period that I had where I was really like zoned in on psychology. I think it, it informs a worldview, and actually, you take pieces of that and and cobbles it together with other things you end up pursuing long term. Right. Um, so start off with psychology. Then I went and studied interior design for a year and a half at FIT because I, I am a creative. Um, but then what I learned is I got, felt a little bit bored mm. because it was just too cr only creative. Right. And okay. what I realized is I'm very right left brained. And I need the analytics too. So that's when I switched and uh, finished my undergrad with uh, a BBA in marketing, which I'm able to do both. Right. And really suited me the best. But it took some trial and error. But I bring all of those things into my career today where I can spend time with my my uh, art, art director mm -hmm. and we could really bang out a, an amazing brand campaign. And then I sit there and geek out with like our analytics team and understand the performance of that, the drivers that it had. And then when we spend time thinking about innovation, when we want to go into something new, what would be the motivators of that? Right. When uh, And then you get into understanding that psychology. So I feel like you know, you take away all the little experiences you have in your life and they actually form your worldview and could be a part of the things that you, the unique things you bring to the table. Even though my undergraduate study degree was very unconventional and would on paper look like I hopped around a lot. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, I, I think if anything, that's sort of a strong statement on behalf of the liberal arts and making all of these different possibilities available to people. And especially in, in those really formative years where you don't don't have a single direction, but you're sort of like getting rounded out as a person. Yeah. And, you know, again, I think what I learned later was that it didn't matter what your degree you got. Right. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wish someone had told me that. Right. But again, this is like, uh, you know, I had immigrant parents and this, you, we have to go back like the Internet of access to information today right. is different than what it was at the time. Right, right. So it's not like I can go Google and be like, how do things work? <laughs> or go to uh, go to like chat bots and ask this, you know? Right. Uh, so, um, you know, but it, in the end, I think it actually uh, built out a, a stronger experience for me to bring all of those things to the table. Yeah, absolutely. So. so you finished your undergrad with your degree in marketing. Yeah. Where did you go from there? Yeah, so uh, I I actually, as I was finishing my undergrad, I applied to over 50 advertising agencies in New York City, and this was when you did it by mail. <laughs> That's a lot of stamps. stamps. Yeah. <laughs> and you do your custom cover letters, and, you know, I literally got turned down from every single one. I ended up getting my first job um, at uh, Lord & Taylor, the department store, mm -hmm. in the marketing department because a good friend of mine knew uh, the manager in the in in this particular department where uh, a woman was going out on her maternity leave mm. and needed somebody to come in and temp for that. So I went in as a temp and that was kind of like my foot in the door. Right. Uh, and then the woman decided not to come back. So I ended up getting the job permanently um, for a job that was never really on the market. Um, so for me, it was it was it was very exciting. I started off in marketing and then um, three years in, they decided they wanted to do a little something called e-commerce and to start selling things online. This was before when there wasn't shopping online, like things right. were just starting to come online. And I was the fourth hire in that department and uh, spent about seven years building the business from zero to uh, $300 million in two countries over seven years, wow. uh, which was really like just such an incredible period for me where I learned how to how to blaze trails, do things that didn't exist. We used to run these sales at the time. They were flash sales where you'd put like an item up or a few items up for like a lunch one hour sale and watch them all sell out. Like this was like in the, you know, guilt 
guilt days where, you know, you would get those like uh, emails like, hey, this is going on sale right now. And you would rush to go buy it. So it was like <laughs> it was a lot of fun to live through that that era of, of innovation. You yeah. don't see much of that anymore as being super popular. But um, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun to just try and innovate. And it really, I learned how to how to lean into technology with creativity mm-hmm. to build something that didn't exist and um, and do it at scale. And now for a short break. This podcast is brought to you by Education Through Music. ETM is a nonprofit organization that partners with under-resourced schools to provide music as a core subject for all children and utilizes music education as a catalyst to improve overall achievement, motivation, and self-confidence among students. To learn more or support the work of Education Through Music, check out etmonline.org. I didn't seek out to work in the music industry, but I always like connected with music. When I first came to New York in, in my 20s, I was fascinated with New York City because you would have all these independent artists on the subways playing music and selling their CDs and telling you about their show. And you just felt like it was this pure art yeah. that wasn't put in a box and had unique sounds. And uh, I remember I would go to CBGBs a lot to go to Battle of the Bands to see some of these indie bands. So it was like the indie scene had always been something that I, I was always very connected with. And then fast forward uh, over 10 years later, and it was it was so cool because I, I, you know, typically when you're looking for a job, you get it through your network at, you know, at a certain level. But I was still also applying to jobs on LinkedIn, and I saw this job to run marketing at TuneCore, and I was like, I don't know, I had never heard of TuneCore before. Mm-hmm. Um, but I looked up what it was, and it, it really fascinated me because I'm one of these people that when I do something, I go 200% in, I can't hold back. Well, anything that I do, I have to like put all of myself in. Yeah. And I just wanted that to add up to more. And when I read what TuneCore was about on this on this LinkedIn job description, I was, I was like, wow, this is so cool because if, if you're not familiar with what TuneCore does, TuneCore is an independent distributor. So it, it is an open platform for any musician to be able to put their music up online and get it up on uh, YouTube Music and on Apple and Spotify. And you do that for a flat fee and the artist gets paid 100% of the revenue back. And what I loved about that was twofold. One, you have artists who are able to go and put out music unencumbered with no gatekeeper Mm -hmm. and be able to put out art that they believed in. And on the listener side of it, it creates this pure form of art that has just been created and put out there because the artists really want this music to be heard, you know, by the world. Right. Like that's their motivator. In fact, what you know when I when I eventually got the job and started at TuneCore in your first month you spend time learning about who are these artists tell me you know like what motivates them you know all the psychology stuff right, uh, right. you know uh, <laughs> because then by knowing your customers you can then better cater to their needs and and make sure that you're serving them well and the thing that struck me the most is uh, you know the very first time an artist will distribute their music with us we put a survey up to ask them you know how they learned about us etc but also why are they distributing their music? And it was just striking to me. So, uh, you know, it's not what you would expect. The number one reason why artists distribute their music is actually to share their music with the world. Mm -hmm. The second reason is to make money. Right. (laughs) The very bottom of the list is to become famous. Huh. Okay. And to be signed. Interesting. Okay. So it's not what motivates them to put their music out. They want to, Number one, again, share this music with the world. It's like a muralist who will paint, you know, a wall and that's not commissioned and they want to make something beautiful. Yeah. And I think that that's what's what's been so exciting is as as independent musicians have actually been making up a bigger part of the market share uh, for recorded music over the last uh, seven years. It's just become one of the fastest growing segments. Uh, It. It, it's because those artists are the ones that are innovating. They're not being put in a box by a gatekeeper. They're making, how many more genres do we have today than we used to? Right. And it's it's a combination of the democratization of music because of platforms like TuneCore. It's also because of this inflection point because streaming 
has made listening more accessible mm -hmm. and you're no longer limited by shelf space. Right. There's like an endless aisle and you can find your micro tastes. And there's actually a lot of parallel with, with music, with even retail, because the same disruption happened in retail, where if you think about what used to be in your closet 15, 20 years ago versus today, you probably used to have like your Polo Ralph Lauren, your, you know, like you had your basic brands because that's what you had access to. But today right. you're going to have much more boutique brands, things that are suit you, different fit. You found those little things that you kind of like. Right. And same applies in music where there aren't going to be a lot more Beyonce's in the world, but there's going to be these more niche musicians that the listeners have like super fandom to because they really connect with their music. So there's this incredible artist named Sevdaliza. Um, she is uh, out of the Netherlands. She's half Iranian, half Dutch. She sings this incredible, powerful music that's dance electronic fusion kind of genre. And, um, you know, she sings a lot about women's empowerment because she's half Iranian. Uh, and with everything that's been happening in Iran around uh, all the protests that happened about that woman who was killed with the hijab, mm -hmm. um, essentially, she she just sings really, really powerful music. But she has a global, global audience. And in every market, when she goes and tours, the audience that is so connected with her music is always underrepresented groups. So when she comes to the U.S., it's the black community. When she goes to Latin America, it's LGBTQ+. Uh, when she goes uh, to the Middle East, it's women. And it, so what you're seeing is this, like, decentralization of listenership, but real, like, avid fandom. So as someone who works with artists and brings a psychological understanding of, of what motivates one to distribute their music, what sort of advice would you have for someone who's maybe a student, someone who's maybe not a student, who's thinking about making their, their music available to an audience? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, we live in such an incredible period of time right now where the access to make music, to play music has just been, the barrier to that has just been greatly reduced. So the advice I would give is is have fun and experiment. Um, I think that the, the tools that you have out there uh, to actually make music, you can get a very low cost subscription to actually make music on your phone with some beats. And you actually don't need to know how to play a flute or a piano or, um, you know, a clarinet like I yeah. tried to learn. <laughs> uh, today, you know, if, if you think about possibly you may want to make music, there's a lot of tools you can get started and start listening. You know, I, I've sat in the studio with artists today that are creating uh, hip hop or um, EDM music and everything starts from the beats. Like mm -hmm. they've got to just get inspired. And then from there, they're, they'll record some vocals and then they'll lay that down with some some um, additional effects and people will uh, jump in on different sections if they're collaborating. And I think that what's so interesting is the tools to do all of that just is available at their fingertips. So if you think you may want to be on the recording side of making music or writing music, you just have so much more available to you to be able to try that, to do it, to actually um, help you, um, you know, you can auto-tune your voice as you're right. recording. And uh, it, I think it just becomes really exciting. And uh, I think that it, we live in this age where you don't need, in order to, to make it, you don't need to uh, go to radio. Like before, the reason there was so much gate gatekeepers around promotion is because artists wouldn't break unless they went to radio. Well, guess what? That's not how music is discovered anymore. Right. Music is discovered from platforms like TikTok and YouTube Shorts and uh, Instagram Reels, where essentially you're in your feed and anybody has a shot at it. And how things go viral is because that piece of content has been shown to a, a subset of a user base. And if that audience like resonated with it based off a bunch of tiny little indicators, they'll show it to more and more and more and more users. And um, essentially, anyone has a shot at it. And um, I think like for me, where I'd use an example with this is you maybe you don't think that you want to go down a career path with music, but you never know. Uh, there's this incredible artist, her name is Jay Maya. Uh, she is uh, out of LA. She actually just made uh, the Grammys like 
top artist to watch that went viral uh, last year. And she used to be a Harvard undergrad and was accepted into uh, Harvard Law School and decided to take a break for a year and was secretly started playing with recording music uh, in her bedroom, didn't tell her Indian parents about it. (laughs) Um, And then she went viral and was making legitimate money from it and then told her parents about it. And they're like, I'm sorry, you're not going to be a lawyer. You're going to do what? (laughs) Um, and, but now she's doing so incredible anyway. Um, and so you never know, you know, just, I think that, uh, because of the access to tools, I think today, if you're interested in thinking you could have uh, a career as a musician, that that's really a viable option. Andrea, thanks so much for sharing your story and for sharing your insight. Thank you so much.